There we go. Okay, 141. Uh, we're going to try to see if I can get this in one take. Uh, and if so, we'll go with it. So we're going to learn about functions, also known as static methods. We'll look at some black box diagrams. We'll look at the parts. We'll talk about being inside or outside the function, formal and actual parameters, and return types. Uh, there's more we can do about this topic, but this is just to get us started. So if you think about a, a standard type of operation you might have to do in Java, uh, let's compute the max of two numbers. So the question would be, well, what are the inputs and what's the output? So obviously the inputs are going to be uh, the two numbers, let's call them A and B, and the output is going to be whichever one's the maximum. So here's a little bit of code to kind of demonstrate what this would do. So you've got, we're going to create this integer m, but not give it a value. And that's going to be um, whatever receives the maximum. We're going to put the maximum in m. We're going to say, OK, if a is greater than b, that means a is the max. So let's assign m equal a. Else, now the only way to get to this else is for b to be the max. Let's assign m equal b. And so at the end of this, if m is going to have either the value a or b, it's not possible for m to have no value like it does up here. And we can print out, OK, the max is m. So this is just a very simple operation you might need to do in Java. It's got two inputs, these two integers, a and b, and it's got a single output, m, for the max. But what we'd really like to do in a program where we have to compute the max all the time would be something like this. int m is assigned do the max operation of a and b. And then this function call would spit out whatever the maximum is. This is what we'd like to be able to do. This would be really fun. Um, the key word here is encapsulate. What we want to do is encapsulate the functionality, going back a couple slides, this functionality of comparing a and b and deciding what the maximum should be into one place, into this function so that anytime we need the max we can just say hey do the max of a and b that functionality is encapsulated in this function call and then the maximum is going to pop out um, this is a really 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 important piece of programming because it allows us to do chunking right we can chunk this computation of the maximum into this function remember we talked about chunking when we talked about pseudocode and outlining Functions are a great way to do some chunking. So we still need to learn the syntax of how to write the max method. This is just the motivation of why we would like to do that. So there's a metaphor that's often used called the factory metaphor. Um, the factory is sort of like this black box. What happens inside the factory, we don't really know at this level of detail, but we know we put in two inputs, A and B, and they're integers, and out pops the maximum, which is either A or B, depending on which one's bigger. This is our factory. Um, here's the syntax for a max method. Uh, this is the declaration or the definition of the method. So we've got public static int. Um, I'll talk about what all that means. Max, this is the name of it. We've got the two parameters. We'll talk about what parameters are. Uh, notice the types are here to tell us what the types are. We've got the body, we've got this new keyword here, return, um, which means something. And, you know, we've got just syntax we've already seen, an if statement, some comparison statements, things like that. So let's um, put some highlighting in here to break this down. The public static part, this part tells Java I'm about to create a function. Uh, technically, it's a static method, hence the word static. Um, methods we've kind of seen um, set color, get num rows, get num columns, those are methods in the simple grid. This is also a method, but it's a static method. We'll learn more about what the distinction between static methods and non-static or instance methods are later. But for now, when we're writing our own functions, we can just think of public static as being another magic invocation that says, go ahead and make me a function. Um, do you have to memorize public static? No, but if you're working on code and it doesn't work, you need to know, well, public static is one of the things that should probably be there. Um, int here, this is the return type. Uh, this is saying that, well, when I do a max, what comes out is an int. Uh, if you think about your simple grid, get num rows and get num columns, what was the return type of both of those? Well, it was int. 
if I take a simple grid and I ask how many rows do you have, the result of that's going to be some integer representing the number of rows. Um, when I do a set color, what does the grid give me back when I do a set color? Now set color has an effect. It sets one of the colors in the grid to whatever color I tell it to. But it doesn't really give me back any result. That method is what's called a void method. Void meaning nothing or nothingness. I get nothing back when I do a set color. It doesn't give me back a value. It just changes the grid. Um, so that's what the return type is. Now these things here, these are called the parameters. More specifically, these are formal parameters. We'll learn more about that in a bit. What we're saying is when we do a max, I need two inputs. Uh, and the syntax is I separate them here by commas. Now I have to say what the types of these inputs are. This is technically a, a variable declaration because I'm saying max is going to take an integer a and an integer b. Um, then we've got our open bracket, and you can see that matches up to this bracket down here. What's in here is what's called the body. Now the body of a function uh, that has a return value has to make sure that on every path through the function we return something of that type. So if a is greater than b, we're going to return a, else we're going to return b. Um, now we're guaranteed to hit one of these statements. Either a is greater than b or it's not. And so we're either going to return a or we're going to return b. What return does is it says, okay, when somebody invokes max, I have to give them back an int. The return statements are what say, hey, pop this value out and end the method. Now return statements, these end the method. So if this method's executing and I see, okay, if a is greater than b, return a, bam. The method's over, it's done, a's been returned. The metaphor I always use, a return statement, is how you know that a, a function or a method in Java, they're like salmon that swim upstream. Because you know how salmon are. They swim upstream to spawn and then they spawn and die. Um, methods in Java are the same way. The purpose of a method is to return a value. Once it's returned the value, it just dies. It goes away. It's finished. Sort of like salmon. Once they swam upstream and spawn, then they just die. Um, so some notes about defining static methods. The public static, as we've said, needs to be there. Uh, the public part means that anyone can use it as opposed to private. Uh, it is possible to have methods be marked private. There's other visibilities as well. This, this is usually called the visibility modifier. The static just means it's a static method. You can just kind of memorize, okay, methods have to be public static. The return value has to be a type, so any of the primitive types we've seen or any reference type we've seen. Um, or it can actually be void if we just don't want to return anything. Um, the name of the method, sort of a, a hidden part of this, names of methods have to be legal Java identifiers, and by convention these are going to start with a lowercase letter. Um, the formal parameters, these are letting us know the number and the type of variables that must be passed into the method from outside. Um, a little bit more on this later, and then the body of the method will be in brackets. So kind of jumping back a slide, Obviously, here's public static, magic invocation. We've got the return value. Now, you note here we've got this int a, int b. That's telling us, well, we're going to have two inputs. We're going to call them a and b, and they both have to be ints. Now, where these ints are coming from is outside of the method. Going back another two slides to our factory diagram, you can see here's our factory, and it needs two inputs. Now, where do these inputs come from? Well, from the factory's perspective, I don't really care. They just have to come from outside somewhere. These are very non-discriminating factories, right? I mean, they don't care, like, if these inputs are, you know, I don't know, uh, diamonds, then they would, like, accept diamonds from anywhere. You know, they could be conflict diamonds, even. Conflict diamonds are bad, by the way, because um, <clears throat> they're supported by horrible things happening uh, in an exploitative way in other countries. Um, but from the function's perspective, it doesn't actually care where these things come from. They just come from outside somewhere. So jumping back ahead to where we were, um, some other notes. This is the salmon metaphor. So when you return something, that ends the method. It's done. It doesn't keep executing. The purpose of a method is to return. If you figure out what you want to return very quickly, just return it and you're done. Um, and this is kind of subtle. But methods with a non-void return type, in other words, methods that have to return something, 
have to return something on all paths through any if then else um, statements in the code. So methods are not allowed to sort of fall through to reach a point where there's no more code to run but it never hit a return statement. So you have to be very careful with if then else chains. Uh, you have to make sure that there's some else at the end or some return statement at the very end to make sure it's always possible to return something. So um, check this example. You actually need a return statement on all possible paths. So if you were to write this, we as humans can look at this and say, well, A is either greater than B or B is greater than or equal to A. There's no other possibilities. Um, so we can look at this and see that either A or B will be returned. However, the Java compiler, not as smart as we are, will look at this and say, well, I've got an if and an else if with no else down here. So that means that what if this condition's false and this condition's false? Well, I fall through and there's no return statement here. That's not allowed. So the Java compiler won't allow this to compile. Now, of course, we as humans can look at this and see it's actually not possible, but that is not good enough for the Java compiler. You must make this an unconditional else uh, in order to get this particular pattern to work. Let's try an example as a um, clicker question. Um, not really a clicker question because we're doing this as a lecture, so I mean this is... Um, you know, a, an online Moodle question. So let's go ahead and, and uh, jump onto Moodle and answer this. So the question is, will this compile, and is this correct? Um, because it's possible for a code to compile and not be correct. So we've got um, our same function definition, but if you notice, we've got an if, but then we don't have an else, we just have a return here. So the question is, does this compile, and is it correct? Um, or is it none of the above? I'll give you a chance to try to answer that. So did you come up with, yes, it compiles, and yes, it's correct, which was D. If so, you're correct. Um, and you can kind of see that, right? Because, um, well, what's going to happen here? Well, if A is greater than or equal to B, we'll return A. We hit a return statement, so that ends the method. What if A is not greater than B? Well, then B is greater than or equal to A. We should return B, so we'll just return B. We could have else return B, or just return B, because it doesn't matter. The only way to get to this statement is if A is not greater than B. If A is greater than B, we return. Now, returning in the middle of an if, that ends the if, and it also ends the entire method. So it actually never gets down here if A is greater than B. So this is actually correct, and it compiles. I should also note that it wouldn't really make sense for something not to compile and be correct, because it can't really be correct if it doesn't compile. You could argue that, well, it doesn't compile because I'm missing a semicolon, but every other part of the logic is correct. You could argue that, but this situation would be highly unlikely anyway. So the answer here is D, it compiles and it's correct. So a question that comes up when you're defining functions all the time is finding the right level of abstraction. So you actually have to know where you are inside the method, um, uh, whether you're inside the method or whether you're, uh, in other words, you're writing the method, or if you're outside the method, it might be using or invoking the method. So, here we go. Um, is this inside or outside the max method? What would you say? This is actually inside the max method. Here we're defining the max method and the code that goes inside it. So this is actually inside the method. This is the method declaration itself. How about this? Is this inside or outside the max method? You can probably guess since the last one was inside. This is outside. In fact, this is probably in main, right? Because we're saying, okay, I want to create this the max variable, and I want to assign it the result of doing a, a call to my max function, my max static method that I wrote. Um, I, I keep saying this, but I want to reiterate that uh, a lot of languages use the word function. Java tends to use the word method. The types of methods we're looking at are static methods, but in any other language, they would just be called functions. So I use the term um, static method and function interchangeably. You can argue that there's some subtle differences between them, but basically they mean the same thing. And if you use them, people will know what you mean, function and static method. So I tend to swap those terms. 
um, because they, they, they in Java, they, in, in Java at least, they really mean the same thing. So this is outside the method, because here we're not looking at the code of the method. Here we're just using the max method. We're like, hey, do a max of x and y and put that in this variable. So another tricky thing when you first learn functions, formal versus actual parameters. So the formal parameters, the names of the parameter variables inside the method. Now we don't know what the actual parameters will be called. They could actually be literal ints or literal strings or something like that. Normally I would draw this on the board um, if we were doing this as a lecture, but I don't really have a board here, so I can't really draw it. Um, but what we'll do is uh, we'll kind of do an example. Uh, later on we have a, a, a slide on this. So can you use a method that returns something of type int anywhere you expect an int? Yes, you can, right? So here we want to do the max of x and something else. Well, what's the something else? Well, the something else is the result of doing the max of y and z. <clears throat> so, like, if y is 4 and z is 7, well, max of 4 and 7 would be 7. So, this here would actually just return 7. Um, Java does these from the inside out. So, in order to do max, I need to know what the value of x is. Well, that's a variable. I'll just look it up. And I need to know what the value of max is uh, for this other call here. Well, it'll just go ahead and do this function first, which will produce an integer. Why? Well, because this max function returns an integer. Then it'll do max of x and whatever that integer is. Um, so you can actually substitute a method call that returns int anywhere in Java you're expecting an int. So here we go. We're defining this function. At this point, we're inside the function. Down here, this is main, where we're reading in some values and doing max of them. This is outside the function using the function. And so, um, you know, you can kind of see, well, here I'm calling max, and what am I passing into max? Well, I'm not just passing variables, I'm actually passing the result of doing a couple of um, function uh, uh, arithmetic operations. So I'm saying do the max of x plus 10 and y minus 20. So it'll do this from the inside out. In order to do max, I need to know what x plus 10 is, so Java will compute that. I need to know what y minus 20 is, Java will compute that. It'll plug both of those into these two spots, and then it'll do max and whatever the results of these arithmetic computations are. Uh, same thing down here. And in fact, you can see one of the parameters of this m is actually coming from this variable up here. So at this point, x plus 10, this is the actual parameter, right? Whereas up here, int a, that's the formal parameter. So at this point, um, we compute x plus 10, we compute y minus 20. Whatever those values are, those get passed in. x plus 10, the value will become a for the duration of the method, just as y minus 20 will become b for the duration of the method. Whatever the results of these arithmetic computations are, get passed in and referred to by a and b just while the method's happening. Once the method's over, all the stuff we know about the method goes away except the return value which ends up popping out and ending up here in M. So um, calling a method from another program so well, we don't really have this example but um, uh, it's possible to have one Java file so one program that calls a method from another program. So here we're saying like, okay, I want int m to be assigned to not just max of 4 comma 9, but utils.max of 4, 9. What this means is there's some other file sitting around named utils that's been compiled that has a max public static method or function inside it. This is saying, okay, go do the max function that's inside of the utils uh, class. And so utils will actually be the class or the name of the program. And we can kind of tell it's a class because it's starting with an uppercase letter. And that's one of our conventions that the names of classes or Java programs are always going to start with uppercase letters. And so we're doing the max of 4.9. The max, this is going to be a function that's stored inside this class. So let's think about drawing a horizontal line. Um, so suppose we want to be able to draw a horizontal line, but we don't want it to be the entire grid. 
we just want to say like, okay, just draw a line from here to here if it's horizontal. So what information do we need to actually characterize this? Um, if we want to be able to draw a line, like maybe we draw it here, maybe we draw it there, maybe we draw a bigger line down here, maybe we actually do an entire row, we don't really know, but what do we need to know if we're going to draw a line of some variety on a grid? So, so think about that. Try to go ahead and articulate all the different pieces of information you would need to know. We would need to know what grid to draw on. There might be multiple grids. We need to know what row are we drawing the line in. So we're drawing horizontal lines. This one's in row 0, 1, 2. So we need to know which row to do it in because this line would be different than like a line down here. So we need to know the row. We need to know the start column and the end column, right? Because here we've got this line here like this. What if we drew something in a different row that was like from column 1 to 4 or something like that. So the thing would be here. So we need to know the start column and the end column, and we need to know the color. So given those pieces of information, the grid, the row, the start column, the end column, and the color, we could write easily write a function to draw a horizontal line. These would be the parameters to the function. These are the inputs, the stuff that needs to go into the factory to get this done. Now, what does this need to return? What does the draw line function return when the function's called? It's actually a trick question. The answer is nothing. Um, it doesn't have to return anything, so it's just void. We don't really want or need anything back when we draw a horizontal line, just like for the same reason when we do a set color of just a single pixel on a simple grid, we don't need anything back. It just draws the color there. Um, so if we write this draw line function, we start with public static void, public static because it has to start with it, and void because we have no return type. If we're going to do a draw line function, we may as well call it draw line. Here I'm uh, up casing the second word. This is often called camel case. Uh, the reason we call it camel case is it's like all lowercase, and then when you see a new word, it becomes uppercase, and then back to lowercase. So it's sort of, I know this is weird, but it's like a camel's hump. It's like flat, and then there's a hump. And then if there's another word in here, that'll be humped as well. So they call it camel case because of the humps on a camel's back, believe it or not. We got the return type. Um, we've got the name of our function. Now we can start thinking about the and an open paren to list out the parameters. Now we can start putting the parameters in here. What do we need? We need the grid. We need the row, the column, the start column, the, you know, the end column, and the color. And then we put the body of the method here. Now... Here's a question. Are these formal or actual parameters? Exactly right. They're formal parameters because they're the parameters in the declaration or definition of the function. These aren't the actual parameters. The actual parameters would be the actual grid that we want to draw it on, the row, like for example, 2, the start column, like 1, and the end column, 7, and then the color. Um, Note that the parameters kind of look like variable declarations separated by commas. Basically, they are. So for writing the body, what do we want to do? Well, we're going to have a loop. We're going to start C out at what column? Well, whatever column we were told to start at. We're going to go up to, but not including, whatever column we were told to end at. And we're going to add one each time. So start condition, condition... Uh, updater. And what are we going to do for set color? Well, we're going to set color in row. What's row? It's the parameter, whatever row we were told. And then C. What's C? Well, it's the current value as we loop through all this stuff. Color. What's the color? Well, it's the color that was passed in. We haven't done a lot with color. It turns out color is another reference type that's kind of built in. And so color is a type, so we can just say color and then the name of the variable that we want for this parameter, just color. So this actually is a, a, a correct function. This actually will draw lines on the grid. If you define this function, you can then use it. So here we go. What does this do to a 10 by 10 grid, assuming that we're using the draw line uh, function that we just wrote? Go ahead and try to answer that. Did you come up with E? If so, you're correct. We're saying draw a line on the grid. Assume that this is our grid. Um, row 2, 0, 1, 2 starting at column 0, this starts at column 0, up to but not including 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but not including 5. 
right? So that's what this will do. These are all like different versions of it that have either been rotated or reflected or something like that. Um, and this one's actually just, you know, it mirrored or almost mirrored or something like that. But anyway, the answer is E. That's what that would do. So you got to talk a little bit about pass by value. Um, all primitive types are actually copied into the method parameters. So if you have an integer and it's a parameter and you uh, invoke your um, function and you pass some value to that uh, formal parameter, the actual parameter actually just copies the value in because integers are all 32 bits. They're actually fairly small. They're very cheap to copy. Um, however, um, a side effect of pass by value is that you can't change them. So here we go. Let's go ahead and try this example out. What does this print? We've got our static uh, function, our static method go, passes in x, it's going to do x plus equals 5. Here's main, we're taking z, we're assigning it to 10, we're calling z, go of z, and then we're printing out z, and the question is, what does this print? What is the value of z? Go ahead and try to answer that. If you came up with 10, you're correct. Because what actually happens when we run this, we copy the value 10 in here, uh, and that gets assigned to x. So x is 10. We add 5 to that, x plus equals 5. x is now 15. z doesn't change, right? We didn't magically put z into this function. We took the value of z, which is 10, copied that in to the first parameter, which is x. So when we print this out, it's actually just 10. Now here's a question, what about draw line? How is it that draw line, this go method, doesn't change the z that was passed into the parameter x? How is it that draw line changed the simple grid? How does that work? Well, that's the difference between pass by value, pass by reference. Primitive types are passed by value, a copy gets sent in, the original still preserved. Reference types are passed by reference, which means when I pass a simple grid into a function as a parameter, what ends up happening is I don't pass the simple grid itself. I pass what's called a reference, essentially like a box and arrow way of referring to the actual grid in memory. That's what I pass, not the entire grid itself, but just a copy um, of, of the way to reach the grid, what's called a handle or a reference to the grid. So, why this difference? Why are we passing primitive types by value? And why are we passing reference types by reference? Go ahead and try to answer that. Hopefully you came up with efficiency. Uh, I think the most correct answer, although simplicity and elegance are certainly high up there. Uh, reference types can be really big. Remember, a string could be the letter A, or the entire text of Moby Dick or Ulysses, or some fairly long novel. And so, uh, because of that, we don't want to have to make copies of this string that might be you know, a million characters long all the time. We want to just pass around references to that string. Just like we don't want to make copies of the simple grid and send those all over the place, we just want to pass a reference to the simple grid, which is why uh, reference types in Java are passed by reference. Cool. Thank you.